so uh, what I'm going to talk about now is very much uh, the same subject as what we just heard. So these two talks are really connected together. Just um, expressed in a different way, both the concept of the two-level principle and the statement of the two-level principle and the proof. Um, so there's going to be overlap in a way, except that the things will be explained differently. So I'm going to start by um, explaining, again, things that we've pretty much already said, what it is that Gotendieck really was aiming for in the part of the piece that we study. So trying to characterize the absolute Galois group as a group of automorphisms of certain groups, which are the fundamental groups of the moduli spaces. He never mentioned doing it in only genus zero. This is something that came from the work of Drinfeld and braided tensor categories. Gotendieck always mentioned doing all moduli spaces and all genera. And the, uh, the properties of Galois, the Galois that we know are that they preserve inertia and that they respect morphisms between the moduli spaces. These morphisms uh, are the ones that include smaller pieces into bigger pieces. We'll see lots more on this later. It's what he basically called the legal. So this is the overall project. And the overall project was two, twofold. One is to get all the, to describe the whole group of automorphisms that do this, which is basically GT, except we're gonna see the higher genus GT. And the other is to see uh, if there are, we need more, more conditions to characterize the Gawa image inside there, which is still the open question. Okay, so this all corresponds to the same thing as respecting these morphisms. The morphisms will come from what he called the game of Lego. This is just a rough outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, and the two-level principle says once you've, the Lego and the two-level principle are the same thing. They basically say surfaces are made of putting smaller pieces together. And also we saw a different, a different um, explanation of this in the previous talk. But basically, if you get the full group that acts on the first four moduli spaces respecting these morphisms, then it extends to the whole Teichmuller tower of all the pi ones of all the moduli spaces with the same type of morphism. So this is the overall plan. Okay, so if I'm going to be telling you about automorphism groups of the, the fundamental groups of the moduli spaces, I need to tell you what, I need to describe them. And I'm gonna, there are many ways of describing them, but I'm just gonna take the presentation by generators and relations that's, that's best adapted to, to our description to go to the Teichmuller theory. So remember that in the first talk, I explained how braids are at the same time diffeomorphisms of genus zero space, uh, spaces, spheres with mark points because the points are traveling without colliding. And at the same time, they are paths on the moduli space. So that the diffeomorphisms of these surfaces up to isotopy are paths on moduli space and the group of such diffeomorphisms up to isotopy is the fundamental group of the moduli space. So um, I'm going to go back and forth between talking about diffeomorphisms and talking about the elements of the fundamental group because they're the same thing. So I'm gonna be describing generators and relations of the fundamental group, but speaking of that group as the group of diffeotopies, which are diffeomorphisms uh, up to isotopy. So these are going to be the generators, oops, these are going to be the generators. I'm going to give you a, a picture to show exactly what they are in a moment. But they are the, the important thing to know about them is what they are on the surface is a diffeomorphism, and what they are is a loop in the moduli space. So I'll give you a proper picture in a minute. But what you need to know right now is that they are, every day interest is associated to a simple closed loop on your topological surface. So you fix your genus G, your number of points, and you have a topological surface. Take a simple closed loop. And on the moduli space, when you do that, well, what you want to do is you think of picking a simple closed loop is you think of picking it very small, like very short, so the geodesic of that loop is of length epsilon, and you're very near the strata at infinity that we heard about in the previous talk. And the Dane twist is a loop in the moduli space going around the missing strata at infinity. So the fundamental theorem of Dane is that these are generators for the, um, for the mapping class groups. Mapping class group is the usual name of the group of diffeomorphisms up to isotopy. Mapping class group is isomorphic to the fundamental group of moduli space. It's generated by these Dane twists. And for, further, and this is why we really like using them, um, they are the inertia generators. So we know that they are going to be conjugated and raised to a power by the Gawa action. 
And so when we look for uh, the type of tower automorphism group, we will require that property. So as to make it as close as possible to the Galois group. So I'll show you the figure, but I do just want to say one little remark before I show you figure, which is that when you put, when you have marked points on your space, generally the loop, it doesn't touch the marked points, goes between them. But because we're looking at the, we're going to be looking at the moduli spaces MGN, where the points are ordered and your diffeomorphisms don't permute them. But if you want to look at the moduli space where the points are unordered, which is the quotient of that moduli space by just the permutation group SN, then what you can do is you can allow your, your loop, simple closed loops to pass through the points. So if you now visualize this in gene zero, and you have like the points one and two, and you just take a loop that passes through both of them, and you do the diffeomorphism that I show in this figure, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Basically, the loop itself makes a half term, its neighborhood makes a full turn. And so the two points are permuted. And those diffeomorphisms generate the full mapping class group of unordered points. I think we're gonna stick pretty much with the ordered points here. So here's what you do. You pick your simple closed loop and you take a little neighborhood of it. You cut out a little neighborhood of it, like just a little cylinder. And then you fix this boundary, you don't touch it, but that boundary makes a complete revolution. So you can see that something that would be a straight line drawn here, say, what does it do after this twist? It goes up and behind and then back here, and it ends up at the same point. And the whole boundary here after your two pi revolution, it ends up where it was before. So you can just re-glue and, and extend this by the identity. And that diffeomorphism is your Dane twist. And so again, these generate the mapping class group, they generate the fundamental group, they are loops around infinity, and they are the, they are the inertia generators of the, of the fundamental group. So Grotendieck, always his point of view is we, um, we don't look at little special cases of anything. We just take the whole axiomatic like structure of everything at the same time. So there are some, um, or possibly some maps between moduli spaces that are special in very small uh, dimensions where they're just because they look similar that he did not consider. He wanted to consider families of morphisms between the moduli spaces or between essentially between the fundamental groups of moduli spaces, which come from, which come from topology, which come directly from topological operations you can do on a topological surface. This was his idea. And he just named two. So one is just erasing mark points. And we actually saw that already in the previous, um, in the previous talk. And it gives you a very simple morphism between the fundamental groups that I'll show in a picture in the next slide. And the other one is cutting the curves along simple closed loop. So this thing here is just a little bit of notation, nothing very interesting. For just reasons of ease, I've made a difference here between mark points N and boundary components N, which are little holes that you actually cut. So that it makes sense to glue two things together along the boundary component. These things are essentially the same and the mapping class groups are essentially the same. Uh, this adds a few trivial central elements that, that don't really play any role and on which Galois acts in a trivial way. So you can think of this as being G with N plus M things, holes, holes, holes without really saying whether it's a puncture or a, a hole with an actual boundary component. Okay, but it's useful to have boundary components when you want to take two of them and glue them together and make a new surface. Okay, so the pure mapping class group is the group of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, fixing the boundaries point-wise. So I'm not bothering with those extra elements that you can just twist the boundary, which are actually central, but I'm gonna leave them out. And which are isotopic to the identity, okay. Modulo those isotopic to the identity, so modulo isotopy. Okay, and so it's identified with a fundamental group and it's generated by Dane twists, and that's where we are so far. And I'm going to talk about a. I'm going to talk about the presentation of the mapping class group. This is extremely important because it's going to be one of the fundamental ingredients for the proof of the two-level theorem. I would say that this. Um, this presentation is going to put it the finger on the fact that the, the whole thing is made of little pieces put together because every relation between the day twists is a little relation living on a subsurface of small size. So there are just four types of relations and here they are. 
you have a very simple relation here of commutation. So if you have two simple closed loops on your surface that will touch, the Dane twist will commute. That is just visually obvious. But what if you have two that intersect in one point, just like in the picture here? So in this picture, um, you can, it's an exercise to do when you start working on Dane twist, you want to take some red and blue pens and draw and see what happens. They just satisfy the braid relation. Then you have this, the donut relation. So I'm always writing I and J for marked points and boundary components, but we should really think of them as the same thing. They're just holes. So it's one, genus one, but with some, with one marked hole, one puncture or one boundary component doesn't matter. You have this relation, which is actually also the four cycle the inside the Bray group, which we kind of already saw. But because if we do have a boundary component in the Bray group, this would be the central element. In the Bray group that we were looking at, which is gamma zero one, uh, gamma, zero, gamma one one, this would be one. But if we have an untrivial boundary component, it's actually that this twist around the, the boundary component. But these are all trivial. Uh, it commutes with everything. It doesn't make much difference in the whole structure. But to be completely precise, this isn't one, but it's just the twist around this, uh, this loop around the edge. There's only one more relation called the lantern relation. And this one lives on a subsurface of type 0, 4, basically with four marked points, which can be holes or punctures, uh, holes or punctures. It doesn't really matter. So I've drawn here. Which one? What? Is the relation B here? You say uh, the intersection yeah, it, you have two relations. You have ABA equals BAB, which is the braid relation. Yeah. And then you have the ABA to the fourth ah. is going to be the central element. Oh, it's the okay. No, no, it, it's two different things. It's just like, it's really the same as saying in SL2, sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, squared equals one, and or to the fourth if you're in SL2 and not PSL2. Let's say in PSL2. Sigma one, sigma two, sigma one squared equals one, and sigma one, sigma two to the third equals one. You have two, just two relations. Okay, well, this is the last one also. So here you have three loops. You can see what they are. Each of the pairs, B1, B2, B2, B3, and B1, B3 intersect in two points. So this is a genus zero thing where the curves intersect in two points. And when you have this configuration, B1, B2, B3, if you had punctures here, it would be equal to one in the usual mapping class group that we look at. And if you have these boundary components, it's equal to the product of the four boundary components. Okay, so a presentation for the pure mapping class group is given by taking all the Dane twist as generators and just all these relations that all live either on a little piece of type 0, 4 or a little piece of type 1, 1, which of course correspond to the two dimension one moduli spaces. And that's going to be a key element of our um, proof. Now, I'm going to start talking about this, but before I do, I would like to use the board a bit and talk about. Ah, is it? Gervais and? No. Vine, vine tree, vine hub, vine tree, no? Yeah, that's what he says. He says, a finite presentation is terrible. You lose all the symmetry. What's wanted is an infinite presentation, but totally symmetric. But he says more. He says, in fact, what's wanted is a group void, which, which reflects all of the symmetries. So I want to talk about that now. I want to say something now, which will tie together the moduli spaces that we just saw, the, the MacLean pentagon that we just saw, the PAB category with his little braids that we just saw the A moves and the C moves associativity and the mapping class group and the geometry of the moduli space. I would like to like tie all these things together in, in one observation. So we saw already in the last talk that if you have like a sphere with four mark points, but, but this here geodesic, so let's say the mark points are numbered, and this geodesic is very tiny. So you're near the boundary of the moduli space. Um, this is, this is, near the boundary of the moduli space, as the smaller you make this, the more you're going to the boundary of the moduli space. The, the moduli space can be compactified with a deline mumford compactification. And this deline mumford compactification, you get it by taking, I'm even gonna make a drawing with five points. Okay. 
let's say these are my two ge geodesics that are small. Well, okay, you take a pants decomposition. So pants, pants are just a, a, a surface that looks like this. We, they were called trinians earlier, okay? Um, I think it's Thurston who called them pants. You take a simple closed loop, the so maximum possible number of disjoint simple closed loops, you decompose your thing into pants, and any number of those loops in your decomposition, you make it very small. You can just make very, just one very small or two or three, doesn't matter how many. Each time you do that, as it goes to infinity, you're getting near to a stratum at infinity. In the infinity, in the compactification of the moduli space, the co-dimension one parts are made by just pinching any one simple closed loop to zero, which we heard in the previous talk. And that gives you a co-dimension one stratum at infinity, which is just like the moduli space of the two pieces that you cut your surface into. Or if you're in higher genus and you, you pinch one loop, you may cut your surface into one, but the dimension will always be smaller. So if you pinch two, you get a stratum of the strata. So each of the strata, moduli space strata is itself a compactified moduli space. And the strata gets smaller and smaller according to how many of these, of these that you pinch. So this is where, uh, in that same talk where he talked about eagles and, and little houses, Ihara said, when you take the moduli space M05, which to me is a really beautiful example for working all of this stuff out, P1 minus three points squared minus X equals Y, in the diagonal. Well, if you look at that, what you're taking, well, it's P1 squared minus seven lines. You have x can't be 0, 1, infinity, y can't be 0, 1, infinity in that line. It's, P, it's, this, it's P1 squared minus 7 lines. But what happens when you compactify it? Do you just put those lines back? If you do it with M04, just P1 minus 3 points, you take those 3 points out, and when you compactify it, you just put them back. But this is not at all what happens here. What happens here, well, you have to look at how many different loops you can put on. So these are loops up to isotopy. So all that matters about your loops is which 2 points they surround. Every loop must surround two points because if it surrounds three points, then it surrounds two points the other side. So you've got 10 possibilities. You can surround one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, two, three, four, two, five, three, four, three, five, four, five. 10 possibilities. Just got 10 loops. So each time you pinch one, you get one complex line. So you add 10 lines. So the, <coughs> the compact, the M05 is P1 squared minus seven lines, but M05 compactified, you add back 10 lines. So this gives a wonderful picture of the Deline Mumford compactification of giving an idea what it is that you glue to infinity. So when you pinch these to zero, I'm gonna make a diagram like this. This just means that wherever there's an edge, you can see I've, I've like this close, this is what we say a tubular neighborhood basically. This with all of these spheres here, which are on the modular space, but just with a very small geodesic, close this skeleton with a little thickness. This skeleton itself, this is not in the moduli space, it's at infinity. It's not in the actual moduli space. It's a point at infinity. So every inner edge corresponds to a, a geodesic that got pinched to zero. And every tail corresponds to a marked point. So now I'm going to show you something that I think is very telling. And in order to explain this, I'm just going to stick to M05 because I think it's enough to understand exactly what's going on. So in M05, you have a whole bunch of different trees. If I do, I'm gonna call an A move, an associativity move, and it's just gonna be the same move that we just saw on an edge is you just, well, the A move is just this. I'm calling it an A move because it's fundamentally an associativity move, and I will tell you exactly why and how. But, well, you can actually see why if you write the parentheses this way. If, you, if the parentheses that we were seeing earlier, that, that we saw in the previous talk were V and W and tensors, they, they can, they're just completely coded by how near you are in a, in a tree. You can write that whole thing with the tensors and the groups, the parentheses, forget the parentheses, just write down trees, it's the same thing. So this move, I've often seen it also called H-I, right? Because 
this looks kind of like an H and this looks like an I. So I'm not the arrested people call it HI, but I'm going to call it A because it's, it really is the associativity move. Okay. So you can do an A move here, you can do an A move here, and you can write the exact same McLean pentagon that you wrote. If you do a series of two A moves here and three A moves here, you get the same pentagon we already saw. It has to commute. What does that mean? What does that mean? It has to commute. Where, what, what's the geometric meaning of that? This is what I want to say now. So um, this represents a point of, of what we call maximal de de degeneration at infinity. It's a trivalent tree. It means that on frem 5 in particular, I have only two ge geodesics. I can't put on more than two simple closed disjoint loops. And I pinch both of them to length zero. I can't do more. But if I do that in, for any number of marked points, I'll, I'll have a tree. So I, if I pinch the maximum of loops, I'll always get a tree. If I have n points, I'll have n tails on my tree. Okay, so here I'm just in five. So I have these two edges that corresponds to two ge geodesics that I pinch. So you can really see this as a, a point on the compactification of the moduli space. So you can interpret it this way. Let, I have a sphere with five marked points. And what I've drawn on the board here is the equator of that, so it's P1. So it's the real line. I've drawn the real line, but it's the, it's the equator of my sphere. So I can place my tree here. I can pick any point in my tree. It doesn't matter what point I pick. What I'm gonna say is gonna be exactly the same whatever point I pick on my tree. So I'm gonna pick three points. I pick three points on my tree. I'm, I'm picking these. And I'm gonna think of them as being zero, one, and infinity. Oh, sorry. One, two, three, four, five. I, I fit my tree into this. And I think, okay, here is zero, one, and infinity. I don't want to put anything on the, well, okay. I mean, there are various ways, ways to do this. It doesn't matter. I, I'll, put, I'll put my third point here. I want all the tails to be at the edge. Here's the idea. When I get near one, I've opened myself out into two branches. And so I'm going to take a little tiny number epsilon. I'm going to erase the numbering because it's just in the way. And I'm going to call this one plus epsilon, uh, one minus epsilon going to zero and one plus epsilon. And if my tree kept branching and branching more, I would add up epsilon squared and minus epsilon squared. And if it branched more, I would add epsilon to the third. So what I what I would be doing is increasing levels of getting closer to each other, increasing orders of closeness. And here I'm going to write like minus, like one over epsilon and minus one over epsilon. And here I'm not going to write anything because I'm landing on that. But if I branched, I would just write plus epsilon, minus epsilon, epsilon squared, and so on. And if I place my tree in the equator and I do it this way, I'm getting five marked points on a sphere. For this little epsilon, I'm actually writing down who my marked points are. And as I let epsilon vary, um, I get a little region. And this is the tangential base point. And this explains why this, this, OK, notice that I've done something here. This is actually a planar tree. I've actually embedded in the plane. So this, is, this is, means that these points are ordered. So I'm not getting a full region around this maximally degenerate point. The fact that I embedded in the plane means I've made a choice. So I'm getting one tangential base point in fact as a little, as a little simply connected region. And what happens now when I, when I do an, an A move? What happens when I take this edge, which is here, and I do this? This is already what it was, so I separate these. Okay, what well, basically I do when they move on this one, I get a different tree. And it basically means that one of these points is sliding all the way over to be near there. And it will not be any one plus epsilon anymore. It'll be one over epsilon plus one over epsilon squared. So basically I'm, I'm moving points 
on my sphere. So I'm traveling on the moduli space. So let me say, here I have a point on the moduli space. It's a totally real point, and it had these point, these marked points that I wrote. So it's very near infinity, it's very near infinity. But now I'm going to take one of these points, and I'm going to do an A move, which comes to sliding, sliding it quite far away. If I think of this with just four points, if I just use this example, this is, this is P. This is the tangential base point here and here. I would just take one plus epsilon. I would take epsilon and move it to one. I would take epsilon and move it to one minus epsilon. I would slide it along. And that would just be the path P that we saw on P1 minus three points. If I do it in the moduli space M05, it's a bit more complicated. There are five of these that we saw already in the diagram, in the MacLean diagram. And they give five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, Arable pentagon. They give five paths on the moduli space. The five vertices are these five trees that we saw in the MacLean diagram before with bracketings just uh, corresponding to who's joined up. And these edges, each one of them corresponds to an A move. And this is simply corrected region called the associahedron. It's real. It's all in, a, in the real part of M05. So now I want to say one last thing before going back to the proper theorem, which is, which is how can you see the fundamental group of the moduli space in these terms? So what are we doing when we're having C moves? I haven't talked about C moves. And when we're having A moves, well, A moves now, you can see that you really are running around the moduli space. C moves also, you're actually doing something that you're not just sliding your points, you're actually taking two and switching them. So you have to leave the, the equator. You have to leave the real line to do a C move and you take two points and you switch them. Okay, so I wanna make a little diagram that I think is extremely um, useful to understand all the, the A's and C's and braids that we've been doing up to now. So here's what you do. You remember when you have a diffeomorphism of the sphere minus five points, the points are moving. So these are just, these, these tails here are just marked points on your sphere and they're gonna move and, and as they move in time, I'm gonna represent their motion by a braid like we, like we did before. And I'm just gonna take this braid as an example. Okay, well, it's a braid, it's a very simple braid. Okay, now any braid like this is in the fundamental group because braids are the fundamental group. But the rules of the game here are you're not allowed to braid anybody. Yeah, you are allowed to braid anybody, but you have to do some A moves first. The, the rule of the game is simple. You're only allowed to braid two strands if they're hooked together on a little Y-shaped thing like that. But their two ends have to be to joint. Otherwise, you can't twist them. So how are you gonna make this braid? How are you actually gonna make this braid? You have to cut it into pieces. So I'm gonna make a little drawing of how to cut this braid into pieces. So you can certainly do this. You can do the first bit of your braid because those two tails are joined, but you cannot do the next bit of your braid. You have to prepare it first. So we're gonna do an A move on this, on this edge right here. Maybe I'm gonna use a different color for the strands. Oh, look, now I'm allowed to braid these two because I hooked them together by doing that A move. I'm allowed to do this now. Okay, and if I wanted to do the next one, if I wanted to go over here and do that, I would be able to, but first I would have to get this and this, these two edges, I'd have to get them together by doing a couple more A moves. So I would, let's say I wanted to do this braid, where it crosses all three. I would have the C that I already did, and then I would have this first A move, and then I would have this other C, and then because there are two, two edges here, to get this guy next to this guy, I'd have to do two more A moves, and then I would do my final C move. 
Okay, fine. So you can cut any braid up in, into these little pieces, but it's not unique. You can cut them in several ways. And the whole point of the MacLean Pentagon and hexagons, the, the whole interpretation is that if you, if you have any chain, you, if, and the, the, these chains are all equal if those pentagons if, and hexagons commute. Any way you choose to do it, any path that you choose to use from C's and A's that gets you down to the braid that you want is going to be equivalent to any other path if the hexagons and pentagon of MacLean commute. They make the braids well-defined. Okay, so this is going to be a principle which I will, I will show you a little bit in all genera. Um, so it's, what it is, is it's a way of describing the fundamental group, which is just the braids, which just had to travel around the moduli space by pieces. I want to go from here to somewhere else. I have to go here. Let's say on genus, in genus, just let's say, say on P1 minus three points. Here's the equator, infinity, one, zero. And I'm at my little tangential base point, And I want to, to do some complicated loop because I just want to do something in the, in the braid group. So I want to do something like, Oh, I don't know, just something like this. Well, I can do my A, but then I have to do a C, which always looks like this, and then an A, and then a C, and then another C, and then an A, okay? I did always just cut it up into A's and C's. C's are just little half circles around the points up or down, and A's are just the paths between. So there's a version of this in higher genus which is a bit more complicated, but uh, this is the main idea. So when I get to it, it will be pretty clear. Yeah, the, the, the little loops, I, you want, what you want to do is you want to represent them by, by changing the planar embedding of your tree. Like if I have the tree at the beginning and I just make the little loop around one and two, I just switch the numbers one and two, which corresponds to taking that little branch and, and actually turning it. So loops in the graph, everything will work the same way, except that there will, you will need another move. The genus is higher, exactly. And in fact, we're gonna see it. Okay. So now I'm going to go carefully through the results of the theorem, and then I may not have time to do the proof, or I'll just sweep very quickly through the proof, which is uh, made essentially of the ingredients that we're seeing on the way. Okay, so we have the map that you get between, more, uh, between moduli spaces if you erase a point. And what does that do on the fundamental group, on the mapping class group? It just makes this Dane twist and this Dane twist become equal if you erase the point that's in between them. And then you have a map, which is a little harder to explain on the map, on the, on the moduli spaces, but super easy to explain on the mapping class groups when you cut a subsurface up on simple closed loops. Because as we just saw, on the, as a morphism between the moduli spaces, it maps each piece to a stratum at infinity. But between the, the mapping class groups, it's so easy to describe this map. You just subsurface inclusion is you just concentrate on one sub piece and you take this, the, the mapping class group corresponding to this piece and you map it into the big one in the easiest possible way. If you have a loop here, like this one, say you're, you just map the Dane twist along that loop to the Dane twist along the same loop in your big blue surface. There's nothing to it. It's like every Dane twist on the little loop, on the little piece, goes to the same Dane twist on the whole blue thing. So you have a super simple map between your mapping class groups that corresponds to a subsurface inclusion. So this is really the Lego picture. Um, and the Lego picture, the essential idea of the Lego picture is that you can get everything by gluing small pieces together. Here I put a rather big piece, or here I put a big piece, but you can actually get everything by gluing only small pieces together, which will become clearer when I explain what I mean. Okay, so we have these two side kinds of maps between mapping class groups that are super simple. And those are the ones that we're gonna re demand be respected. So without saying it exactly the same way, we already saw that GT respects these maps into genus zero. And so we're, now we're just adding to higher genus. So this is what we're gonna have. First of all, I'm gonna go back to the GT that we already have, the genus zero one. And I'm just for simplicity, I'm gonna ask that lambda is always equal to one. 
So at the end, they, this has all been generalized completely in joint work between me and Nakamura to the case of general lambda. And there's lots of little ugly terms that show up in the formulas, but it's fundamentally the same. There's no fundamental difference. So what does it mean to ask for just the group where lambda equals one in terms of the Galois group? If GT were the Galois group, lambda is just the cyclotomic character. So it really just means that instead of looking at Galois Q bar over Q, I'm looking at Galois Q bar over Q app. So it's obviously the most important part of the Galois group, and we're going to just concentrate on that. So from now on, I'm really just going to talk about that. But again, I insist on the fact that this is a technical simplification, but the general case is known. So from now on, I'm going to suppose lambda equals one just to make me happy. And I'm expressing the GT that we already saw. I'm expressing the gene as zero GT. First relation is this, but I'm expressing it a bit differently. Instead of taking XY letters in the free group on two generators, which I said were generators of F2, I'm going to identify F2 with a pi one of, of P1 minus three points. And I'm going to identify these letters with Dane twists on loops on the different kinds of surfaces. And if I do that, well, I get something rather nice because I can sneak the first relation into higher genus. Of course, I could also express it in genus zero, but I like to do this because I've got one thing in genus one, one, one thing in zero, four, and one thing in zero, five. So what is the pentagon relation here? It's the same pentagon as before because the braid generators they're inertia generators of the braid group on five strands, which is the mapping class group of zero five, which is generated by Dane twists. And they are Dane twists, which are also the inertia Dane generators. Those braid generators that we saw are just the Dane twists and they're the Dane twists along these five loops with this symmetry. And so this is the exact same pentagon we already saw, simply identifying those braids now as Dane twists along these loops. I always using Greek letters for loops and the corresponding Roman letters for the Dane twists along those loops, trying to feel morphisms. So the, I like to see the first relation as being on one, one, although you don't have to, you can see it in genus zero if you want. And the second relation is this triangle and the third relation is this pentagon and that's the GT that we already saw. But we're gonna add one more relation. And what happened here is that we found we were not able to prove that GT acted on the higher genus mapping class groups without adding this one relation. Um, and I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. I, I, we do not know if you have to add this relation. There have been many things proved since we added this relation that show many simpler versions that you can add and it will still work. But this one is really corresponding to the whole geometry of the moduli situation. So I'm keeping this one here. So you have all these loops on moduli space and what happens? Well, let me go back to let me go back to this for a second. What what are you doing here when you say f of b three b four? Your what it corresponds to doing. I'll tell you what it corresponds to doing, and I'll say this again a bit more clearly later. But I want to say it right now because it, what you're doing is you start by choosing a pants decomposition. So let's say you're going to choose b one, beta one, and beta three. Start by choosing a pants decomposition, and then you are going to move it back to itself by making successive moves where each time you move one loop, it goes to one that intersects it in two points. So we're going to take beta one to beta two, and now you have beta two, beta three. Then you move beta three to beta four, and now you have beta two, beta four, and then you move and you move and you put five things that goes right around the Pentagon. And when you get back, you have the same pants decomposition as before, although in fact you've switched beta one and beta three, but it doesn't matter. You have the same pants decomposition as before. And each time you do that move, you add a factor of F, Y, because each of those moves is an A move and it corresponds to running along the pentagon in the moduli space, it's the edge of the pentagon. And that A is acted on by F. The fundamental rule, I'll get back to this again, but the fundamental rule of the Lego is when you do an A move, it comes to replacing a loop in a pants decomposition by another loop that intersects it in two points without disturbing the rest of the pants decomposition. That is an A move. And when you do it, the Galois action multiplies it by F of the old Dane twist comma the new Dane twist. And this is the rule. And everything we've seen up to now hasn't been written in those terms, but that's what it has been. We saw F of sigma one squared, sigma two squared, which are the two Dane twists around one, two, and two, three. Those two Dane twists around points one, two, and two, three, they intersect in two points. And that's exactly what that F was. It's the old guy, the new guy. So this is always the rule. Every single time we make a move, 
in a pants decomposition of one loop to another. So here it's gonna be E3 to A1. So if we move the loop E3, which is here to A1, we see that it still doesn't intersect this other loop. Well, if this one is E3, maybe it's backwards. We move it to A1. It still doesn't intersect this loop here. Every time what we're doing in this relation here is we're moving one loop to another loop that doesn't bother the rest of the pants decomposition. Every single one of those moves is an A move. Every time we do that A move, it's a, it's a, it's a straight associativity path on the moduli space and the Galois action multiplies it by F of old, old Dane twist, new Dane twist. And if you do the six operations, you have the patience to do the six operations written here, um, you, get, you get back to where you were and it's a loop equal to one. Just one thing. <laughs> When you move, when you do an A move, you move a loop to another loop that intersects it in two points. And that happens in all genera, but it only in genus zero, you get only those moves. But in higher genus, there's another type of move. Let me go very quickly back to this picture here to show it. There's another type of move. If you have a pants decomposition that has one of these loops in it, you can move it to the other. You can and it doesn't bother the rest of the pants decomposition. And this we've called it a simple move. We call it an S move. This is the new move that you have to add in higher genus. And what happens when you change your pants decomposition, not by an associativity move, but by an S move. So what happens then is you multiply that path on moduli space by F of the old Dane twist squared, the new Dane twist squared. So here you can see in each move that I've made, whether it's an associativity move or a simple move that I've made. And this corresponds to, I could write it as a diagram, just like the Mach 9 Pentagon. I haven't done it, but it corresponds exactly to that, just as this chain of moves goes around the Pentagon. No, these are, all, these are already true for the Gawa. The Gawa group acts this way. And in fact, this will be proved as we go along. This everything you prove for GT is proof for the GABA group. And note that this is the relation has to be added to GT. So maybe there are more moves, So here's the important thing about these moves. No, but here's the important thing about these moves. They generate the whole mapping class. They generate the whole fundamental group, which is the mapping class. Group. So you don't, you could have more moves, but you don't need them. These are generators. The A moves, the C moves, and the S moves in higher genus, and just the A and the C moves in genus zero are generators of the whole fundamental group and even of the whole fundamental group void based on those. So it's not that you can't have more moves, it's that you don't need them because these generate. Okay, so to prove that the Galba group satisfies this, I'm simply going to prove that the, the, the Golden Excitement group does, and then the Galba group is inside it. Okay, so. I want to, to get through the part of the talk that really shows how this works. And the proof of all these results is something that I can sweep past quickly because the main thing is like the whole structure of the, of the idea. Um, by the way, well, let me make a quick remark, which will come back later, but I want to make it now because it connects right up with that. If you now make a, a, a diagram like with, we had there with all the tr different trees, and all the different C and A moves connecting them, which really represents the fundamental group void on M05 with all of those base points being connected by different paths. You can do the same thing in any genus. You can do the same thing on the genus G moduli space with N mark points. You just take all your tangential base points at infinity. And again, these, these little twists and then the A moves and the S moves, they, they generate the entire group void. And, but what corresponds to the Mach Lane Pentagon? What the MacLean Pentagon actually does is it serves to tell you that if you take one face of the groupoid, one face of the groupoid with only A moves and no Cs, that is simply connected. The MacLean Pentagon, the fact that it commutes, the fact that if you can go here and you can go here and that's equal to one, or all the way around if you want to do that, and that's equal to one, that shows that that region simply connected. It's a topological reality, the MacLean Pentagon. And if you now do this on genus G and you had add this diagram into the rest of it, you have this big uh, diagram of, we call it the pants decomposition complex. And I, was, I meant to get back to it later, but I'm not sure I, I will reach that far. 
but you have a big pants decomposition complex just like this, in which every vertex is a pants decomposition given by a, you know, a maximal number of loops. And the pads are these A moves and S moves and C moves. And you're really describing the moduli space, the group, the fundamental groupoid of the moduli space based in infinity. And you need the faces that, that are simply connected on the moduli space. You need your axioms to say that they are simply connected in your, in your, your formal axiomatic ex expression of this. And in order to make sure that the proper faces were simply connected, we had to add this face. By hand. We could not prove that without this, the thing was simply connected. And what does it mean to be simply connected? Apart from the fact that it really reflects the proper geometry of the moduli space, it also means that it doesn't matter what sequences of moves you choose to do a given braid. The, the simple connectivity of those faces means that they all give you the same braid. And we have to have that in order for this to make geometric sense. And we were not able to prove that the corresponding groupoid was actually the fundamental groupoid of the moduli space without this relation. This relation added the simple connectivity, which is something that we turned to a paper by Hatcher and Thurston to prove because they said it. They actually described this something like, something like this in a paper and mentioned in a remark at the end, you could also do this. And we realized that you could also do this was just what we needed. So we got in contact with Alan Hatcher and he actually proved to us completely that the groupoid that's exactly analogous to that, but in higher genus with the extra S moves is simply connected if you add these faces. But without them, we don't know it's simply connected. And I would tend to think that it's probably done and that this move is, this, this, that, this, this that is truly necessary and makes the, this subgroup smaller than GT, but it's something that we don't know. Okay. So the first main result is Obviously, this inclusion. I'm not even going to go into this inclusion because we've seen it lots of times. This gamma now acts on the whole Teichmuller tower. You don't want to say uh, GQ up, but rather you want to say the kernel of GQ to the uh, D cross, yes? I want so this, this notation here is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This notation. GQ, GQ you're right, you're right. This is Galois. Q bar over Q ab. So the ab, the ab should have been, yeah, the ab should have been there. That's, that's right, that's it. Right. For some reason I made the same mistake. No, no, GQ ab is the hat star. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I keep making this mistake. You're totally right. This is, this is of course Galois Q bar over Q ab. Okay, why is it inside there? For the obvious reason that we already had with GT. This is the group of everybody who acts on the Teichmuller tower of all mapping class groups and respecting the maps. GQ does that, therefore it's inside. So why is it a group? Okay, here I just mentioned that we took lambda equals one. We could do it in general too. Uh, the, the ensuing equations are not, not that pretty and there's lots of little things that come in there. It's annoying, so it's nice to leave them out. Uh, the first piece of work we did was together with Pierre and also Alan Hatcher and just on the case lambda equals one. And that contains everything I'm saying here. Then there was a second one where we generalized the whole thing to general lambda, which in some ways was harder, but more, but less, less of a key. Okay, so what do we have in higher genus? Well, because we have those relations, I'm gonna show this. This is something really important. It's about the action of all of gamma, but in particular, it shows you, everything that you show in gamma shows you something about the Gawa action. So, okay. Important little remark, every single loop on any surface of type GN, every loop is going to have a neighborhood that can be either of type one, one or type zero, four. So you, every loop, this loop here, you can cut it out onto a little neighborhood of type zero, four, which is right there, but you cannot cut it out on a neighborhood of type one, one. It's one or the other. It's completely well-defined. This loop here, you cannot cut it out on a neighborhood of type zero four. It's around the whole genus hole. So you have to cut it out on a neighborhood of type one, one. And every single loop has a neighborhood of one of those two types. Okay, so what does the locality property say? It says that when, okay, I'm going to have a lift of the Galois action to automorphism. So a priori, it's just outer automorphism. Every pants decomposition gives me a lift of, the Gal action to an actual automorphism. And when I take that lift, if I take any other loop, any loop in the pants decomposition, any other loop, the action on that loop, the Gal action on that loop, it will 
it take place entirely on the little sub piece. It won't, it won't use other day twists along complicated loops that cut through my pants decomposition. So let me give an example here. Okay, so here's an example. He's a pants decomposition is a maximal collection of loops. So here's an example of a pants decomposition. Every, um, every portion is a pants, including the ones with just a marked point, which also counts as a hole in the pants for a very thin person. Okay, so, and it cuts into, we already saw this in fact in some earlier talk. So, so here's this precise statement of what I was saying about the locality property, okay? So for every fixed pants decomposition, you can lift your canonical outer action to an action. And this action is gonna fix every, it's gonna fix everybody in the pants decomposition, which is it, just what we saw when we saw P1 minus three points and we, and we just said F of X is, is raised to X to the lambda, but now we have lambda equals one, X is just fixed. So it's like, when we say we lifted the other action to an action, an automorphism, which fixes X, it's like saying we choose the pants decomposition X, which is surrounds the points one, two, X like X, one, two. It's exactly the same that we already saw, but it's kind of put in this more general topological um, situation. So what happens now if your loop that you want to calculate the Galois action, you want to calculate the Galois action now on B. So what if your B is, for instance, here you have your pants decomposition is drawn. And what if your B is this loop here, say? So it lives on a one, one piece and it intersects one loop of your pants decomposition in one point, but it doesn't bother the rest of the pants decomposition. Then you act on it this way. Like I said, it's, you could conjugate it by F, what is F? When you're in the gamma group, it's the F sigma that we already saw that acts on the associativity move. When you're in gamma, you have a general pair lambda F where, well, now we're taking lambda equals one. So it's the F of your element of, um, of gamma. And it's F of old squared, new squared. It conjugates that loop by F of old squared, new squared. But old squared, new squared, well, old is this one and the new is say this one. They live inside your piece. They don't go anywhere else on the surface. And it's the same holes, and this, is, this corresponds to things we've already seen in genus zero. We didn't quite see them this way, but it corresponds. If you now have a loop like this one, that e, let's say we take this loop here. It's on this zero four type piece. It intersects one loop in two points, but it doesn't touch the rest of the pants decomposition. Then you're gonna conjugate it by F of old new. And this gives you, already the action of gamma, so the gamma action on every loop, every day and twist of the pants decomposition, and every day and twist that, on a loop that lives inside one, one, zero, four, or one, one part of the pants decomposition. Fine, but now what if you wanna just calculate the gamma action on any loop? You take some huge loop that you know, goes all over. What do you do? All you do is you keep making, so what is this when I change this loop to that? It's an A move on my pants decomposition. I just changed my pants decomposition by one A move, which is you take a loop to another loop that intersects it in two points and doesn't touch the rest of the pants decomposition. So what I'm saying is, Galois acts on an A move by sending it to A times F of old new. No, no, I am going to tell you how it acts on all the generators, but I'm doing it in stages. First, I'm telling you on just the ones that are in the pants decomposition. Okay, so but then, if then you say so far, if I want to compute for another generator, yeah, how do you do it? Another, but the exactly, yeah, this is exactly I, what you have to do. No, it's the same F, if there is no F sub P, it's the same F. Here's what you do. Let me just tell you what happens. Let me just tell you what happens. You, when you change your pants decomposition, let's say just by just one loop, just one loop from this one to that one, you're gonna uh, change your lift by in the inner automorphism by F of old new. And that will be the new lift. So now, wait, let me finish. The new loop will now be acted on trivially by that new lift. And the old loop will be conjugated. Okay? And if you change your pants decomposition by this kind of loop, yeah. then you will conjugate your 
your lift to buy in of old squared, new squared, F of old squared, new squared. And you can do these moves to change from any Pascal composition to any other. Yes, exactly, exactly. Just for you do it step and you, to go from P to Q, you do an A move, an S move, an A, S, and, and each time you just conjugate by F of old new. If it was an A move, an F of old squared, new squared, if it's an F move. Okay. So, and, okay, so you should specify before defining F sub P the rule of conjugation from what you find from F sub P. Yeah, so that's exactly what this that's exactly what this specifies. Yeah, anyway, I want to go on staff no time. I want to just finish my statements. Okay, don't be more, don't be so moral. <laughs> okay. I just want to finish my statements because I'm not going to have time to talk about the proofs, but the statements and plus these these uh, these um, elements of context pretty much provide the sketch of the proof, which is basically um, the essential step of the proof is the the simple connectedness of the of the pans complex with these with the faces given by those relations. Okay, so I just want to finish that. I basically just want to finish with the summary of the assertions. So. I'll, I'll, you always have to put the app down here. Sorry about that. Um, the image of the map lands in out star because it's inertia preserving because of this formula that shows you that every day twist will always be conjugated. And if you don't have one of these day twists that you get from a simple move for your pansy composition, it doesn't matter. You just keep moving and moving your pansy composition until you get to the loop you want. And those moves are completely transitive. And so, and each time you just conjugate by f of old nu or f of old squared nu squared, so they are always conjugated. So that shows that you really land here, which is where you need to leave to land for it to correspond to Galois action. So this is the whole Teichmüller tower assertion. What is the Teichmüller tower? It's just all of these groups connected with all the morphisms that either erase points or the subsurface inclusion. All of those are respected pretty much by what we saw before, kind of the whole construction makes them be respected. The local property shows that if you just have a piece, it doesn't matter because the Galois action lives on that piece. And the last uh, thing that I want to say is the two level principle, which we've already seen several times, but viewed this way just means the four relations that we saw at the beginning, we had one on one, one, zero, four, zero, five, one, two. Those were our four relations. They correspond to the actions on these and they allowed us to act on all of the mapping class groups according to this, this Lego moving method that lets you go everywhere and tells you how to act on every day twist. And because of the subsurface inclusion thing that, that the action really is on small pieces, it satisfies the, the subsurface inclusion method. So that's basically it.